liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waltman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waltman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Monday, September 12th, 2022. Time for another show. Time for us to note the fact that yesterday was September 11th. And I'm glad of it. It was on a Sunday, so we didn't have to deal with it on a Monday, and that's just fine. And, uh, you know, it's getting wearisome trying to figure out exactly how to deal with the the annual uh, remembrance anyway, beyond just saying, okay, yes, I remember, and you don't have to make a public show every single time of telling us that at uh, 9, 12 p, you know, a.m. on that day, you know, this was happening on what floor of each tower, et cetera, et cetera. I appreciate those who do it, but it doesn't have to be done by everyone. So, you know, it's getting to be about that time where we can simply have a more simple remembrance of it. And Sunday makes it even easier than ever because we don't have to do it on the year. So that's great. Anyway, let's see. Um, uh, as usual, breakfast uh, on the air and tea on the menu because of the Queen. So there you go. We're having tea to be British. We're having tea every day anyway. But, you know, but now we're telling them it's for out of respect for the passing of the British monarch. It's been another interesting weekend reading stories of why you shouldn't be that terribly upset on the passage of a, uh, the passing, I guess, of a, the passage, like just going someplace on a boat or something by a British monarch, not remarkable in itself. Passing of a British monarch, um, interesting, but that's about it. And uh, there you go. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, Mighty OCD reminding us, of course, today is, well, I usually say Eastern Orthodox, but we can say Russian Orthodox because they're much in the news. Russian Orthodox 9-11 is today. We always love to do that. Uh, why not make it Russian Orthodox as they are much in the news as well. Lots of news coming from the uh, the big, uh, would you call it, is it just an offensive or is it a counteroffensive? No one can really tell for sure. Uh, by the Ukrainians appears to be gaining territory back, liberating various cities. Uh, I did see interesting question posed the other day, and let me see if I can call it up in my Twitter thread. But uh, now that the well tide appears to be turning counteroffensive, says Greg. So the official military muckety mucks have decided that's a count. I guess. I don't know. Does it matter how close in time it comes? Like, if you wait six months before you start your counteroffensive, is it just an offensive? I don't know. You got to wait a certain number of Freedmen units, I guess, or maybe at least a Scaramucci before you begin your offensive. If you just wanted to stand as an offensive and not be defined by the fact that there was an offensive before yours from the other side. No, I don't know. So Greg says no to something, but I don't know what. We'll find out in a few minutes. Uh, time is just a concept. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> being on the show is just a concept. As a matter of fact, you can just send notes all day long and I could read them to everybody. Uh, it was Brandon Friedman whose tweet I had seen wondering whatever happened to Russell Bentley. And you might not know who the hell that is. And I didn't know by name, but I recognized the video that was attached Russell Bentley was the guy we mentioned, I guess, so uh, somewhere around the beginning of this war. We just don't know what the hell it is, whenever it was. But this was, uh, Russell Bentley was the American Yahoo who attached himself to the Russian troops in the course of their larger scale secondary invasion of Ukraine, which took place in February. Uh, but you might recall that he w had embedded himself with the forces unofficially for no particular reason, except that I guess he, he seemed to be sort of right-wing MAGA kind of guy, and so therefore pro-Russian, and so therefore he was going to be a, you know, look, looking to be a tough guy and embed himself with the Russian forces, and he was a huge cheerleader for the Russian invasion. Up to and including saying, yeah, the Russians are going to liberate Ukraine and denazify Ukraine, the whole Kremlin line and everything. And uh, they've got the men and they got the material and they're going to kick the ass of the bad guys. And then, anyway, uh, they watched him for a little while and then they told his background st story 
for the first week or two of the invasion, and then we never really heard much from him. And in the face of this successful, so far, counteroffensive and the long stalemate that preceded it, uh, it's a good question. Whatever happened to this guy? And uh, I don't know. Where is he living? What's he doing? Is he, does, has Edward Snowden seen him? This guy, I, can this guy come back to the United States? Has he come back to the United States? And we, just quietly, no one knows who this stupid idiot is, so they just let him come back. And uh, I don't know what you're going to do with him exactly. And I don't know what the crime exactly would be that you would charge him with, but I'll come up with something if you give me enough time. Uh, but it was a good question. So uh, along with the question of uh, wh whether this is an offensive or counter-offensive or whether uh, Charles is a king or a counter-king, we don't really know. It doesn't really matter that much. But good question, what happened to this guy? We know what happened to Greg Dworkin. He showed up after passing a few fun notes uh, in text and now here to deliver them himself. Great. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Uh, good morning. You know, so it's a very existential question. Like if yeah. I text you, is that considered live? Uh, yes. No. I don't know. Well, you're not on the air live, right? I would be saying right. well, now I he's am. texting live. So okay, it's not quite the same thing, that. Right? No, I guess not. It's, and if you text, if I text you first, are you counter texting or just answering? Yeah. You I know. don't know. So uh, that, that these are all important questions. Uh, another important mm. question here, yeah, sure. uh, which, uh, you know, I, I was uh, happy to see answered is when in the world is uh, hmm. the story about uh, the king replacing the queen going to not be the top story? No. Oh. Yes. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't uh, relish 9-11 memorials. I don't relish 1214 memorials here in Connecticut, mm -hmm. Newtown. And uh, if they fall on a Sunday and they're slightly less covered because of it, or it feels a little bit less yeah, uh, saturating, I, kind of, I think that's just a wonderful thing. So I was pleased to see Ukraine's battles and their battle wins uh, pushing the queen and 9-11 Memorial is much lower down on the uh, front page in the New York Times digital edition ah, yesterday okay. by, by noon, good. which I think was great. You know, one of the things that uh, people don't talk about regarding 9-11 is, is a very interesting phenomenon. And, uh, you know, the author of the piece, uh, Tom Junot, actually wrote about it. Yeah. And that is that um, the pictures of people jumping off the buildings oh, yeah. as they were burning have been suppressed. You don't see them. You can't find them. And in fact, if you try to post them on Facebook even now in 2022, they'll oh. get banned. They'll get pulled. I guess just that one famous one that they allow. Yeah. Well, that one even. Uh, by suppressing the falling man, Tom Junod writes, and he wrote the Esquire article about it, Facebook is again deeming some stories too disturbing to tell. Hmm. I'm hoping the platform will adjust mm -hmm. its algorithm to allow these stories to be told on this day of all days. May all who died on 9-11 rest in peace. And uh, I think that's hmm. uh, certainly I appropriate uh, uh, they were doing commentary. That. 20 years ago, yeah. he said, I began investigating the banishment from the public square of a photograph I saw on that morning and never again. I wound up writing The Falling Man because I discovered that the taboo photograph told stories of so many. Hmm. And so, you know, it's just an important thing uh, to keep in mind. People like to shape narrative and make it the way they wish. It's true for 9-11. It's true for, uh, you know, we we uh, almost uh, started blogging because of the way people were trying to uh, shape narrative about that yeah. and yeah. Uh, the Iraq war. And uh, lo, these many years later, uh, some things have changed. And in fact, some things have not. Hmm. Well, and mass media's ability the, the to you know, keep up with what actually is going on, like, for example, which gets more coverage, uh, the Queen, uh, mm -hmm. who yes. has passed, as you point out. Yeah, so that's not over. in passage, but in passing. Uh, or Joe Biden's speech about democracy. And the answer is pretty clear. It's mm. not Joe Biden. No, they're not. Uh, all right. Well, it is. It's always an interesting question. What? gets uh, selected for coverage uh, now or well, equally what gets selected for suppression as well and whether or not that should be anything but well uh, we always have to well you always have to question your media you're supposed to be able to do that they're having a tough time of it in in Britain where they they don't have the uh, the written backup of the constitution there I understand there's a few stories out uh, that they're causing some concern of people who are showing up along the 
what funeral cortege route with signs denouncing the monarchy, which, okay, there's plenty of people who are uh, anti-monarchial in in Britain, despite the pageantry, etc. Uh, and, of course, it's supposed to be the sort of place and, where and you're allowed to express US, that you know, dissent. Oh, yeah. There's some controversy around well, that, too. We, you know, we had a little bit of, of the dead, or Don't speak ill of the dead right now, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. Et uh, yeah, but they, uh, but they are arresting people for it in Britain, which, you know, I mean, we're, people are outraged about it, and I think rightly so, although uh, it's not as clear-cut that they can't do that in Britain, if you're disturbing the peace, as they say, with your sign, I, I, I imagine you could probably get yourself arrested like that here in the United States with the right kind of a sign. I don't know if it would last, though. Well, I don't know. Uh, they, they certainly have, uh, shall we say, different traditions than we do. That's true. The very fact that the monarchy that. Monarchy is one uh, clear example of that, that. Oh, yes, that's probably true. We don't have that. Right. right. And how monarchs uh, in previous uh, years. Yes. Uh, some of them hundreds of years ago, reacted to folks saying stuff like that about them. Well, you know. Yes. Well, different traditions. Really chop your head off. Uh, they are having difficulty figuring out the boundaries of their mourning, I guess. They have not had to do this for well, it's, it's some time. That's one part of modernizing the monarchy. Yes. They say. <laughs> I, I just read a story this morning, I, but it was on Reddit, so who knows? Maybe it's all garbage. But just a guy who was uh, saying that he was uh, frustrated waiting in line for a long time at the self-checkout at the supermarket uh, because people were having difficulty with the scanners for some reason. And only when he got his turn did he realize what they had done. They turned the the beeps off when you scan something. So the scan would come up, but it wouldn't give the familiar beep to let you know audibly that it had scanned your item. And he asked about that and said, well, this is a problem. It's causing difficulty for everybody. And they said, don't you know we're in a period of mourning and we've turned off the beep as a sign of respect to Her Majesty, which I don't think that was ever a formal part of uh, any mourning in the past because no monarch of the United Kingdom has passed Well, this is a tradition in England that goes back more than 600 years. You simply (laughs) do not beep in the presence of Her Majesty. Yes, exactly. Well, that'll be uh, sixpence, sir. Beep. You know, they never had that. And, uh, well, they had to modernize all their money, plus the scanner said. So this is a new tradition. So I guess from the, in the future, from now on, if you're flying in your Jetsons car, but King Charles III eventually dies, you have to turn the sound off. So electric cars, well suited to the, to the new era. Right. Well, crazy. I, I don't have a lot to say about the, the monarchy and, and the coverage. I said it's important news, and that's great. But, you know, there's other things going on as well. All right. So let's uh, look at a little election stuff stupid here story. in the colonies, no hands. as it were. Quite. Uh, and uh, yeah, interesting piece today by Nate Cohen. Yes, the polling warning signs are flashing again. Democrats are polling mm-hmm. well in exactly the places where surveys missed most in 2020. So don't overly rely on the polls. If the polls are right, Democrats will do well. If the polls are wrong, then they won't do well, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, You didn't need this story to know that, but it's true. Uh, On the other hand, I think it's a good reminder that, uh, you know, don't uh, think that polls are the only information you have. We also have the results of special elections. We have, uh, and this polling story, as I noted on Twitter, was written as if Dobbs and uh, Post Road don't exist, uh, wow. as if Trump is on the ballot because they're comparing it to, uh, you know, uh, uh, poll like errors in 2016, for example. Okay. Uh, or 2020. Yeah. And uh, uh, Trump isn't on the ballot this year, and that makes a difference. Sarah Longwell had a really, really fascinating podcast with okay. Tim Alberta. Hmm who is a, uh, a center-right uh, uh, correspondent, but very good, does his work uh, from Mi- uh, Michigan, but knows the Midwest extremely well. And part of their conversation was about Michigan and Ohio and how things are going. A uh, slight contrast there. Mm-hmm. In Michigan, uh, they were talking about the uh, gubernatorial race, a word I love, gubernatorial. Everyone I mean, nothing else that. like it. Sure. And, uh, you know, Gretchen Whitmer is probably going to win and she's ahead in the polls. Good. But the reason that it's not simply a slam dunk because Tudor Dixon is such a nutcase hmm. is that regular folks in Michigan are still annoyed at her about two things, one minor, one major. All right. The minor thing they're mad about is the roads still aren't fixed. The roads are terrible. You know, in northern Virginia, don't make fun of that. It's like a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And right, if you, you go in there and you promise that. you're going to fix the potholes and you don't, people mm-hmm. 
people get annoyed. That's but true. the reason that's a minor and not a major thing for Whitmer is that everybody promises to fix the roads. Right. Nobody does. It's part of the deal with the Michigan winners. Huh. And huh. so, you know, they don't completely take it out on you. They're just annoyed at you for it. Okay. The major thing that's an issue for Whitmer holding her back is people are still pissed off during COVID. Not that her COVID response was bad. Okay. Uh, it's that it was a uh, differential response. Do as ah. I say, not as I do. You know, it's it's like the, the French laundry thing with Gavin Newsom in California. That's a restaurant. Oh, yes, and right. You, and you now can't say you can't go and gather in public and there are restrictions, but I'm going out and I'm going to party with people. Yes, everybody you know, seemed to have and that. And so problem. she had some of that, and people still remember that. So that's the one thing holding it back. Nonetheless, I think everybody did that, apparently. Yeah, well, everybody in power did that. Yes, yes, that's what I mean. Uh, everyone who's everyone, of course. Uh, and so, yeah, whatever. that is a big deal, and people still resent that. And so, you Why know, not? That, that's part of the equation. Nonetheless, Tudor Dixon is so bad, and uh, Gretchen Whitmer has done enough good things yeah. so that uh, she'll probably win. Ohio Besides. is a little different in the sense that Michigan is really a, a purple state trending blue and Ohio is not a purple state. Uh -huh. It's a, it's a pink state trending redder. Mm. And so the fact that Tim Ryan is doing so well against JD Vance is one of the things that the Nate Cohen polling story talked about. You All know, right. It looks like they're doing okay according to the polls, but if they missed the same way they missed last time, he's probably mm. behind by seven or eight. And so uh, Tim Alberta was saying, you know, my head says Ryan is such a good candidate and J.D. Vance is so bad. And all the signs like having the Republicans rush in with extra money because they have to. Russian. And rushing in, I rushing see. in Just with so out. many uh, uh, dollars. Well, where does the GOP get their money anyway? Right. Uh, so, uh, you it's know, uh, my head, Tim Alberta says, yes. uh, says that this is really a competitive race. My heart says, nah, you know, it's Ohio. Uh -huh. And yeah, so, you well, know, it's it's uh, kind of interesting. And Sarah Longwell in response said, OK, but sure, let me give you an interesting question here. What if Ohio isn't really an R plus eight state? What if it's a Trump plus eight state and then, mm. uh, you know, Sherrod Brown wins? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he has. Won. What if it's only Trump you know? that makes it like that's the way people feel about it? Well, he's and not the only uh, so in, in uh, semi-support of Candidates Matter, there's a new uh, Ohio Suffolk USA poll out. Excuse me? <laughs> what kind of poll? Suffolk. Suffolk. Oh, Suffolk yes. Suffolk polling. <laughs> USA Today. <laughs> what do you mean, Suffolk USA? Mike DeWine, 54, and uh, Democratic opponent Nan Welly, 39. Okay. But, 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 but. J.D. Vance, 46, Tim Ryan, 47. Yeah. I, I like so the if Tim it's Ryan such a better. highly Republican state, mm -hmm. how is Tim Ryan doing that well? Well, maybe the polls miss. Well, if they miss, how come they only miss for Senate, not for governor? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and they do miss for Senate. I, I don't know. I don't think I have an answer for that. Oh, of course, you know. That, I mean, well, so you mentioned again, the you know, don't, don't put all Ryan's your, your eggs in the polling basket, but at the same time, yeah, Tim Ryan is doing well, and he is a much better candidate than he's Vance. Does, he's running and let's campaign, hope that uh, Tim Alberta's uh, head is smarter than his heart. Um, yeah, you know. Or his I gut, hope his heart catches up. Yeah, right. Oh, did he didn't to specify whether it could be his gut? Well, no, he said heart, but then okay. he said gut. You know, my gut oh. is just I can't I can't give Ryan I see. the win. I can't well, a, because it's Ohio. You should stick with either heart or gut. And two, never make that mistake. You know, but, you know, again, that, what would you have said about New York's uh, CD19 before it happened? We have other information besides what would I have said? The, uh, the polling. You know, uh, Kansas and the referendum, was it going to be a blowout and so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. In other words, all the yes. specials are leaning Democratic. It's not just the polls. The special results, which are election results, the only poll that matters, They're real. are agreeing with the polls. So are they that wrong, really? Well, it's a question of where they're wrong. <laughs> and it's also a question of what direction they're this. wrong. And, and so in the end, we don't really know, do we? We'll just have to wait. Oh, boy. But, uh, you know, don't uh, be confident of anything. This is just a wacky year. It's a different year. It is. It is. It is weird. post row. It is post Dobbs. Trump isn't on the ballot, but he's in the news daily. Yes, Last night's news too. is for some reason that he didn't specify. Right. He was in Washington, D.C. last night. 
And uh, no, it's not nearby. because the marshal is at the Supreme Court made him be there. He probably just wants to play golf. It's just that he has such well, a big mouth and talks about everything. The fact that he wasn't talking about it raised speculation that maybe he's, uh, you know, giving a deposition to the D.C. Uh, uh, well, he's doing something. Grand and jury that you're not he, allowed to talk about. He showed up to the plane in golf shoes, which he does frequently anyway. But I think he might have been on his he's way retired. from golf rather than to golf because it was not golfing weather here yesterday or today. So he wouldn't come here to golf. He may just yeah, have left it, it the was course. raining. So as uh, George Conway said, yeah. I don't know why he's there, but it's a raining. <laughs> there are any number of reasons, certainly, why he could be here, but uh, none. Yeah, he hasn't blabbed about anything. So that's unusual and probably means it wasn't his choice. But how how much how much of not his choice was it? Like, you're under arrest kind of choice or, well, I'd rather not be there, but I have, you know, an appointment. Right. Okay. And then George Conway followed that up with saying, I have zero indict. I mean, insight into what's <laughs> in happening here. I don't see why he has to show up for that, though. But, you know, anyway, yeah, but no word on it. And um, we probably would have heard around here if he was on his way to his golf course. It's around the corner. So I don't think well, the morning's here. young, you know, so these things may come anyway. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Nonetheless. All right. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I am intrigued to try. I, I can't wait to find out exactly what stupid reason that doesn't mean anything he's here for. Meanwhile, here's the Washington Post. GOP seeks midterm reset as inflation, abortion, temper, uh, ambitions. In other words, abortion up, inflation down. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, uh, Paul Kane, uh, PK Capital, Washington Post congressional reporter, writes, pretty amazing admission by Republicans here in this piece, he tweets. Inflation isn't cutting it as a campaign issue. Quote, broadening the message is going to be necessary, end quote. So inflation looks like the way it's going the way of gas prices. Yeah. Which is to say, because it's going down, it doesn't have the salience everybody thought it would be mm -hmm. having. Uh, just 1% of GOP ads now mention inflation. But that was their thing. That was the yeah, thing was they were going to run on. A week and ago. don't worry about abortion. Nobody cares about that. Right. Everybody's going to be gas prices. Well, don't worry. The gas prices went down. There's still inflation. And then then there wasn't. Yeah. And so what, you know, it, it's very hard to scramble with just a couple, literally a couple of weeks left. You can count it in weeks uh, before the election. Yes. And I like so, the transition uh, to scramble from having eggs in baskets too. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, this is uh, insurrection fallout, 16 weeks left for a heap of questions. January 6th panel weighs its end game. Mm, They're going to have another hearing yeah. at the end of September. What are they going to do? Who are they going to have to testify? Are they going to ask Mike Pence? Are they going to fight about it in court? Do they have time to do these things? They don't have any stupid DOJ 60, 90 day unwritten rule hmm, about what true. they can and cannot do <laughs> prior to an election. But they don't have a lot of time. So, uh, yeah. you know, we're, we're getting ready. It's September. You know, it's already mid-September. So we are getting ready for the end of September, January 6th committee show. And if it's as good as their last series, if this mm. season is as good as last season, it's going to be something worth watching. Yes. Uh, like the uh, new Game of Thrones thingy or something. Let's right. See. It's uh, 9.24 a.m. on Monday. That's significant because at 10 a.m. on Monday. Today. Today, uh, both sides in the Mar-a-Lago uh, dispute over... Uh, special master stuff mm -hmm, have yeah. to be in front of the judge arguing about whether or not the uh, classified stuff should be excluded as the Department of Justice requests yes. from the special master provision, even while they argue about who that special master should be. Yeah, they both submitted lists, while. short lists. Each one uh, gave two. And uh, the DOJ gave two good people and Trump gave one good person and one political hack. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the political hack will, hack will be I mean, logic says the political hack will be removed and they'll be left well, with Trump's good person. And therefore, that's who the judge will pick. That's that's the guess. That's a, good a judge guess. named Deary who everybody actually is pretty happy with. Uh, oh, which judge? Deary. Deary. D -E -A -R -I -E, oh, so he's. I oh, that's the special master. That's nominee. the special I master. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, judge. Uh, uh, Cannon is which, the one. Deciding. Which are offered to Cannon by the Trumpers. Right. Got it. And uh, from what I hear from people like Andrew Weissman, totally acceptable. And given the situation and hmm. the Cannon favors Trump in all things, the assumption is that if that, DOJ doesn't tremendously to... object 
to this choice, then Canon will take it. But at the same time, the more important salient issue is what about those hundred classified documents? Yeah, what about uh, everybody stuff? has given Canon an off ramp to say, OK, we'll just exclude those. Trump is fighting that. So what happens? We find out uh, because they start arguing about it at 10 o'clock. All right. Well, that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, she's uh, she painted herself into a corner because she was afraid to stop the damage assessment from the intelligence community with, with good reason. Right. And, so uh, uh, the DOJ put cardboard uh, down and said you can come out this way if you wish. Yeah. And you we'll can't see separate these things. And uh, yeah, the truth is, if you uh, impede if you exclude the, the hundred uh, classified documents, yeah. it really doesn't matter what else she does. Right. So uh, but, anyway, but I she's hope a that Trump works. judge, and nobody thinks that she's like totally fair and so yeah. we'll see what happens uh yeah and i guess you'll have to take a look down the road and see if there, there's really maybe no way i can save this for him so maybe we just tear off the band-aid now and say yeah oh, and I, besides you know sorry. i really don't like the 11th circuit overruling me so you know maybe yeah. i'll give them a reason not to okay well you, you try to you seek not to be overruled explicitly it looks bad and it, it's a it's bad for your promotion um, prospects, uh, except in Mago world, I guess. Right. So, okay. Well, so, bottom line there for everything is uh, Trump is still in the news. He's not on the ballot, but he's on the ballot. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, the polls suggest Democrats are going to do well. All the other information, how much money is being spent and risen, uh, uh, you know, uh, raised, I oh, should say, yes. uh, okay. by uh, each party. Everything favors the Democrats. If the polls are wrong, the polls are wrong. But if they're right, uh, you know, good for us. And we'll do a little bit about uh, the one battle war still to be decided in mm -hmm. Ukraine after the break. All right. Well, great. Uh, something to look forward to. And, uh, yeah, we'll have to wait, I guess, for the election results and then uh, hear about how they're fraudulent. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue, uh, let's see, what was it? We were waiting for election results or something, something. Well, you but, know, we'll see what happens. We got an election coming up in November, and uh, I'm not in the prediction business. I'm just saying that uh, signs on the ground, as well as signs in the yard, ah, uh, suggest that the, the Democrats will do okay, but we'll see. Good, okay. We should put that on a sign and put it out in the yard. Yeah. Uh, so uh, turning message. to Ukraine, we'll do okay, uh, I probably, think maybe the but... best thing to do is give you some short summaries about what's been going on here. Yes. What? Uh, what? Here's uh, one from the Ministry of Defense, uh, UK. Okay. I like it because it's short and I like abbreviated things. UK, short for Ukraine. Uh, no, that's UKR. Oh, I see. United <laughs> Kingdom. Uh, well, intelligence update. Shorter. Uh, in the face of Ukrainian advances, Russia has likely ordered the withdrawal of its troops from the entirety of occupied Kharkiv uh, Oblast, west of mm -hmm. the Oskil River. Isolated pockets of resistance remain, but since Wednesday, Ukraine has recaptured territory at least twice the size of Greater London, because like all politics is local. In the south, near Kherson, Russia is likely struggling to bring sufficient reserves forward across the Dnipro River to the front line. Uh, an improvised floating bridge Russia started over two weeks ago remains incomplete. Long-range artillery is now probably hitting crossings so frequently mm. Russia can't carry out repairs. The rapid Ukrainian successes have significant implications for Russia's overall operational design. The majority of the force in Ukraine 
is highly likely being forced to prioritize emergency defensive action. Mm. The already limited trust deployed troops have in Russia's senior military leadership is likely to deteriorate further. Yeah. And that's the basic mm. bottom line in terms of what's going on. All right. Should All right. So here's uh, Maria Rutska giving a brief recap of uh, the whole big picture here. Mid-July to late August, Ukraine systematically targeted Russian supply lines around Kherson, Kharkiv, Crimea, Donbass, and other areas. The High mm-hmm. Mars Range and other undisclosed arms allowed clinical strikes. The armed oh, forces right. of Ukraine, AFU, warned of an imminent Kherson counteroffensive. Russia basically put all their troops in Kherson to prevent that. Uh, Ukraine uh, worked hard to cut them off. And while the troops deserted everywhere else, they then invaded the places and counteroffensed okay. in the uh, places that uh, Russia had pulled their troops from. And it worked. And it was brilliant. And they won the battle. Okay. That's a good short summary. Okay. And... Uh, Phillips O'Brien, the uh, analyst, military analyst uh, from the UK, Ah, says uh, Sunday update, the line finally moved and it was meaningful. The Ukrainian victory that was many months in the making. Did you hear there was a little breakthrough in exploitation in Kharkiv Oblast by the Ukrainians during the past week? Uh Yes. As I'm sure you've seen, the Ukrainians have liberated more territory in a few days in Russia seas since April 19th. It seems sudden and stunning, but it wasn't. It was the result of patient and methodical Ukrainian strategy and planning. The most important thing is by the time the Ukrainians launched their attack, the area seemed to be very poorly defended by Russian troops. And what troops were there were not of great quality. Hmm. A research fellow in the Ukrainian Institute for Strategic Studies basically says there was no Russian defense in depth. It wasn't tiered. So once the Ukrainians broke through the front lines, there was nothing behind it. So they just kept going. Well, I guess that's what you would do. I, it right. makes you suspicious, though. You must have been thinking the whole time. It's a trap. And then it well, wasn't. Yes, it's a trap. Yeah. The reason for this is twofold. First, the summer of 2022 was too destructive for Russian forces. All the attritional losses they suffered banging their heads against the wall in the Donbass for tiny gains mm. sucked too much lifeblood from their army. Events that looked like small victories for Russia really were bloody seizures of territory that didn't help them prosecute the war. Small political gains such as Severodonetsk, not worth the cost. The other Eric. was that the Ukrainians making such a big fuss about Kherson drew Russian reinforcements there during much of August, so much so that in Kherson, the Russians do have tiers of defensive lines, which, by the way, probably won't help them no. because now that they're in fixed position, the HIMARS can hit them from range. Mm. So the overall strategy was brilliant. Make Russia put forces where Ukraine can more easily damage them while thinning, uh, thinning out Russian forces where the Ukrainians wanted to move forward. So they played Putin like a violin. Well, all right. And uh, that's basically the summary of what's going on here. Same thing from the Institute uh, uh, for the Study of War. War is their thing. That's a U.S. think tank. I guess so. (laughs) Uh, The Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkiv Oblast is routing Russian forces and collapsing Russia's northern Donbass axis. They're not conducting a control withdrawal. They're hurriedly fleeing southeast. Russian forces have previously weakened the northern Donbass axis by redeploying units from the area, et cetera, et cetera. And again, one has to remember that after you get the crap beat out of you and then you redeploy elsewhere, you're not in fighting shape. Yes. And so it's not the same thing as well. We'll just regroup and have a second line and then we'll go ahead and turn around and fight the enemy again. Yeah, I'm really excited to fight. They left all their ammunition and guns and and uh, All the tires blew up yeah and and their trucks and their tanks behind not that they were mm. in working order because they don't have very good uh, maintenance right. as mean, part of their deal as we've talked about just be uh, and junk again uh, i'm else. no expert on this but there's an awful lot of experts who are looking at this explaining to us what's going on this one is from uh, lawrence friedman in substack mm. gradually the in then substack. suddenly yeah. How did you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually, then suddenly, said Ernest Hemingway in the Center of Surprises. <laughs> and as with bankruptcy, so with military defeat. Sure. The Kharkiv uh, offensive, Kharkiv offensive has been described as opportunistic. This is because the Ukrainian high command appears to have decided to take advantage of Russia moving substantial forces toward Kherson to deal with the much advertised attack there by opening up a new offensive against areas that have been left with weaker defenses. 
The Russians were suckered by it. It would, however, be unwise to assume Kherson is only of secondary relevance. Southern Ukraine remains of great strategic importance for the Ukrainian economy, the links of the Black Sea. That's where the, you know, grain goes out by the Black Sea and the connection to Crimea. The offensive there has not been halted for the sake of Kharkiv, and it's also still making progress. Just that's going to be a different way. They're going to blast the Russians in fixed places, so it's not going to be quick, you know, progress, but it's going to be progress nonetheless. So that's what to keep in mind. Now, Mm -hmm. what does that mean in terms of the war? The battle is won. The war is not over. Uh, And so now you have to turn back to central command there. Uh, David Frum probably made the most pithy comment on this. And he looked at what was going on and said, you know, strong 1905 vibes. No. 1905. What happened in 1905? In 1904, 05, during that period. Different. Yeah. Russia fought a war of choice against the Japanese empire. Right. And got their heads beaten in and lost the Russo-Japanese war. And by 1905, Russia was so upset about it, there was a revolution. Hmm. Now, the Tsar survived that, that but the 1905 revolution set up the 1917 revolution right. where the, uh, the Tsar didn't survive. So yes. uh, uh, Frum's point about 1905 is twofold, which is you know great when you make a pithy point and it's short, but it actually has two implications. Right. One is that Russia lost that 1905 war, and the other is there was a revolution after it. So okay. which 1905 thing you think he's talking about? Doesn't matter. He's talking about both. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, there may be more even. So this is Politico. Uh, Putin's problems aren't just on the battlefield. The Russian president must now contend with an unusual level of criticism of his commander's competence in Ukraine. And you know the deal. If things don't go well on the battlefield, it's got to be somebody's fault. And so uh, you know, even casual observers of the Russians know. That, you know, the question now is who's Putin going to blame? Well, you know, if I were head of the Russian army, I would be worried about measuring my neck size right now. And I would stay away from windows and tea. Yeah. Well, that's right. Uh, Two two good pieces of advice. That's uh, I I do understand that there is. um, Well, there's more open ish call for Putin's. Resignation than has ever been the case. I think yeah, there was been some zero uh, council in Saint Petersburg. It said yeah. he had committed treason. That was quickly suppressed. But then yes. well, Julia well, Davis, who happen. monitors Russian news, ah. yeah, uh, had posted a English uh, subheading so you could follow along. Yeah, she posts: Life comes at you fast. Pundits on Russian TV realize the military is failing and the country's in trouble. They're starting to play the blame game. Some of them finally mm. understand their genocidal denial of the Ukrainian identity isn't working in Russia's favor. So one of the guys yeah, uh, was actually do. saying, you know, this isn't going to work. It doesn't make any sense. You can't obliterate Ukraine. It's not going to happen. And, and people on the show turned on him and started yelling on him. But they were very <laughs> nervous. And it didn't sound like it was like, you know, the staged, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, sort of shouting match that you often would see on reality TV. Like the the nerves were, we're all gonna you're gonna get us all killed unless yeah, we you know unless we watch this you. round of eclipse featuring huh. panic Kremlin propagandists on several state TV programs mm-hmm. discussing impressive gains by Ukraine's armed forces and reclaiming control, and then she's got an article about it, uh, you know if that's what you want to watch. So uh, let me give you that so okay. you'll have yeah, it for people your, can go uh, see what you know, panic people, looks but, like. But it's uh, it's actually pretty impressive in terms of what's going on now. This is a, uh, a summary from a fellow named Mark Galietto, Galietti, who says uh, during his PhD, he actually interviewed uh, people during the Afghanistan uh, withdrawal by the Soviet Union. So he's got some background uh-huh. to look so at this. This is an exit poll of <laughs> yeah, the Soviet he did his own. He yeah. did his own focus group. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Rossiskaya Gazeta, the Kremlin's newspaper of record, the Kremlin's New York Times, as it were. Interesting. It's as stodgy as you might expect, but in light of the extraordinary Ukrainian successes in the past few days, and I'm reading this because it gives you insight into what uh, what Russians see, at least what Moscowites see. Okay. Because as many have pointed out uh, to the elite, Russia is Moscow and St. Petersburg, and everybody else can go fight in 
you know, in <laughs> Ukraine as far as they're concerned. <laughs> it's instructive. Well, it's funny, but it's true. Yeah. It's instructive to see what's telling what it's telling Russians today All right. and what it's not. On Russia First today, and most yeah. obvious, there's not even a hint of the Ukrainians advance from Kharkiv deep into Russian held territory. Quite the sure. opposite. Instead, there were tallies drawn directly from Ministry of Defense briefings, and that would be Russian MOD, not UK MOD, right. of alleged enemy losses. 4,000 killed in action since September 6th. At mm. the same time, picking up a recent theme of Kremlin propaganda, much talk of foreign mercenaries fighting on Kiev's side, although, of course, they mm. too are, Russians are told, being hammered. So they brought in this whole idea of we're not losing, but if we were losing, it would only be because NATO has come down on their side. Uh, okay. But we're not losing. But even so, he writes, the propagandists can't help but trip themselves up. The account of how an MI-35 gunship crew allegedly thwarted Ukrainian river crossing. So that might be comforting to the paper's readers, assuming they don't look at a map, hmm. because... They place this action on the Oskil River, meaning that the fighting is happening deep in Russian territory, Russian mm. held territory. Yeah. So this is admitting mm. just how deeply the Ukrainians have already gone. And presumably they're relying on readers imbibing the triumphalist tone and not digging into detail. But that illustrates wider issues here. Number one, the Kremlin seems stunned and has not yet come up with a plan as to how to try and spin this. So to a large extent, the media are ignoring the bad news until they get it directed. Nobody wants to show initiative in unless they get it wrong, hmm. you know, unless they get it wrong, which is incidentally the Soviet style defensive thinking that bedevils the military, especially disastrous in a time of rapid and unpredictable change. Like the Ukrainians aren't doing what you told them to do. Yeah. Right? The, the Kremlin's happy to lie, it. but they can't ignore reality. And so it's really struggling to create any positive narrative on issues where some basic fact checking is possible that's the kind of dilemma we saw in chechnya we saw in the soviet war in afghanistan and tends to be a sign that the state's control over the narrative is cracking it's okay. not so much in his opinion that russians up to now have believed the official line they just have had no reason to both disbelieve it because that's dangerous uh both politically and morally and then he says i remember one parent of a veteran from Afghanistan I interviewed for my PhD. She said, mm. I didn't want to believe what people were saying about the war because if I did, I would either have to act or be a part of it. Hmm. Which is uh, an incredible statement. Hmm. Apply it to people who voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> I didn't be want to it. believe what people are saying because if I did, I would have to act on it. Yeah, like it's up to me either do something or go all in, I guess. Better not to be know. Crazy, yeah. So I if you that's... wanted to know why is it that with all this information, whatever your uh, political bubble is mm -hmm. about Trump, how could you still support him? The answer is I don't want to know anything that would change my mind. That would bother me and make me think that maybe I was wrong. I can't deal with that. Yeah. So best not even to question it. Right, and, and, I guess. You know, that's how people... You know, get yeah. through life. Well, sometimes well, we, we've we've discussed that certainly, and trying to find ways to give people uh, face-saving off ramps from yes. their crazy. Except now, it's yeah, it's like Judge well Kennedy's example. That. It's exactly right. Yeah. So this desire to avoid the truth as long as possible is a very human one, alas, but especially prevalent in authoritarian regimes. Can't get much more authoritarian so. than a court where the judge decides to make their own law. But in due course. And especially as the official narrative becomes less and less credible, it does break over time. So the evening TV shock jocks will still rant, but they'll matter a lot less than many believe when even core state propagandists like that Russian newspaper are at a loss. Despite their closeness to the administration, this is a sign mm -hmm. of political pressure and maybe even crisis. The end. And mm -hmm. so, okay. you know, uh, on the one hand, you can't tell Ukraine when to negotiate, they'll decide, and they've already set out terms. Russia mm, withdraws, yes, right. admits they were wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the pressure to negotiate has a core truth. The war will end because it'll be a negotiated end, because that's how all wars end. And it'll I, be negotiated yeah, when guess. Russia, with or without Putin, is ready to negotiate, seriously negotiate. 
Mm. And they're not there so. yet. But putting pressure on Putin is one of the ways you get to war's end. And so that's what this is all about. Yes, or Putin. That doesn't mean that Putin falls tomorrow, but the pressure is growing and he's going to have to deal with it is the point. Yes, and if he does fall, if he falls out a window, that's a very different situation. Right. So, Meanwhile, yeah. uh, Zelensky, who is showing the world how to lead, mm -hmm. do you still think we are one people? Do you still think you can scare us, break us, force us to make concessions? Don't you really get it, he said last night? Don't you understand who we are, what we stand for, what we're all about? Read my lips. Without gas or without you? Without you. Without light or without you? Without you, he's talking to the Russians. Mm -hmm. Without you, without water, without you, without food or without you, without you. Cold, hunger, darkness, and thirst are not as frightening and deadly for us as your friendship and brotherhood. <laughs> but history nice. will put everything in its place, and we will be with gas, light, water, and food, and without you. That's his message to the Ukrainian people. Very inspiring. He's winning. Yeah. They're losing. That was a very dramatic won, message. They haven't lost but that's what's going on here. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that, that was the big threat. I guess everybody said, well, you know, you want to repel the Russian invasion, but if you fight us, we'll cut you off from all of these things. You'll, you'll, well, we'll they tried. They the actually gas, launched we'll some missiles and long, knocked out electricity light. for 80% yeah. of Ukraine for like uh, three hours. So, uh, yeah, it was difficult. To and the Ukrainians fixed it because it, they're so. very good at that. But it was very, very dramatic now that I uh, understand what he was talking about. We'd rather live without gas, light, water, all that than with you on our territory. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Understood. I mean, I don't know if the Russians care, but it's a nice speech. It's a good one. Right. I mean, rallying. if, if you're talking about divorce, I don't think I succeeded in having you put it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, right. right. So uh, what's left is the big story that we haven't talked about. Oh. Because nobody really knows how it ends. Shoot, which one? Uh, well, the nuclear plant in Ukraine that's uh, uh. just been shut off because the Russians okay. keep uh, shelling it. And the worry is something really terrible will happen there, which is why international inspectors had to go over there and see what's going on. Yeah, you shouldn't crack those open. Uh, Germany is making it its top story, not the advance oh. in Kharkiv uh, Oblast, for example. And uh, they're quite worried about another Chernobyl. And, you know, how that sure. ends, I don't know. Uh, and and that's Chernobyl. just another reminder, yes. war isn't over. Yeah. And uh, that's still something that the Russians can uh, do out of spite and create an awful lot of damage and chaos without, uh, you know, openly well, you can, you can going nuclear. You kill a lot of people without winning. Yeah. They know that, well, that and you, they don't have any hesitation. That's true. I got, you know, if you're killed in a war that uh, your side wins, you're still dead. So that's not great. And uh, yeah, you can do a lot of damage. They've already had some Pyrrhic victories, so why not some disastrous losses for the other side as well? And uh, it, they could do an awful lot of damage and hurt a lot of people for a long time and do as much damage as going, you know, to nuclear weaponry, perhaps. But without actually technically doing that? I don't know. Is that the sort of thing that might appeal to Putin? Or is that the sort of thing that would cause people to finally topple him inside Russia? I don't know. Uh, especially if that, I mean, it's no, no guarantee which direction the, uh, the the radiation goes from destroying a, a, a nuclear plant either. And I don't know what the prevailing winds are like there, but wouldn't they be maybe going west to east, blow it into Russia? Or and maybe... It, the opposite happened, I think, in Chernobyl. So maybe it does. Maybe the prevailing winds there are east-west. I don't know. But I don't think anybody should roll those dice. Uh, but a desperate Putin might do anything, I guess. Uh, so, you know, he, a uh, dead Putin, Putin is under pressure. Just saying. And he is starting to get desperate. Of course, while uh, this uh, uh, counter-offensive was going on yes. in uh, Ukraine... I guess uh, Putin wanted to highlight everything as normal. And so he uh, had fireworks in honor, I guess, of the city of Moscow for a birthday. Just because it's and, normal. And had the, uh, the unveiling of the world's largest Ferris wheel, which I guess got stuck. <laughs> don't, don't go on any, any mechanical anything in Russia, honestly. Well, that's, that's – uh, we – Oh. have just unveiled the yeah. world's largest right. window. <laughs> and we are inviting <laughs> uh, take the a look. Russian general staff who is in charge 
of a Kharkiv Oblast yeah. to come visit it with us. Cut the ribbon. Not that anything bad will happen while you're forced to hunt to the uh, uh, world's largest uh, Ferris wheel oh, or God. anything like that. Yeah. But uh, let's just say uh, I have specific invitations that uh, you can't refuse. I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. Get on the Ferris wheel. Yeah, we'll discuss right. it at the top. Oh, thanks. I'll wait for Ferris wheel 2.0 where you work the bugs out. Don't go on that. Uh, all right. What, were there usually fireworks in Moscow at this time of year or something? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. They said it was normal. So, okay. World's largest Ferris wheel. That's supposed to. What's the? What was the previous world's largest Ferris wheel? I don't know. Probably the one. The in London Britain. one. The Ion London. Yeah, maybe. I, they haven't built anything. They're now going to be a rash of gigantic Ferris wheels in the Gulf states. I imagine they'll have to build some of those as well. Yeah. Well, you know, there's nothing like the cyclone in Coney Island. But what are you going to say? <laughs> Make it out of wood. Make it out of wood. Make it rickety. <laughs> <laughs> Make it think like it's going to fail at any. That's part yeah. of the excitement, All right? We okay. Uh, I'm this not has been the running for so many wheel. years. You never know when it's going to be the last run. It's due. Oh, okay, it's due. No one knows. Well, don't you want to make history? <laughs> <laughs> Go uh, on it. Wow. Well, scary. All right. Well, so much for the Ferris wheel idea. Bringing glory to Russia with the largest Ferris wheel. I don't know who thought that was going to be a great thing, but hmm. They're into the big things. Still, you know, win a war. You know, that's the real Happy issue, day. I guess. Okay, well, uh, yeah, there it is. Okay, look at that. Our new Ferris wheel in Moscow. And it, so it didn't work. 140 meters high. There's nothing like that in Europe, say, except the other very large one. I guess on the other side of Europe. But, okay. Right, and the last Another thing is, fan. oh, by the way, new piece in the Washington Post, Americans are finally feeling better about the economy. Gas prices are falling. Science households mm -hmm. are learning to deal with inflation. Right. Consumer sentiment has begun inching up in recent weeks. Uh, decades high inflation appears to be easing. And at the same time, Americans are making small changes, buying meat in bulk, for example, shifting more of the shopping to discount chains. While consumer sentiment is still fairly low by historic standards, we're starting to see pretty dramatic improvement. It's very much being driven by a slowdown in inflation, particularly with gas prices. So uh, mm -hmm. that's why only 1% of uh, Republican ads these days are making that the central feature. You know, of course, what are they going to do? Well, you don't have to be a political genius to guess. It'll be about crime and caravans because yes, that's what it's like always that. about. Of late, yes, um, and uh, we'll see. That may yet still be effective. There, they've laid the great groundwork. There, uh, Republicans still know. believe there's Ask crime Ed Gillespie rampant. how effective it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is that. The caravan thing never really seemed to. Oh, you quite know, and I should have brought that up trick. too. Okay. You know, when you talk about the fact that polls can be wrong. Yeah. Uh, Gillespie, North and Virginia polls were wrong, but guess which direction? Mm, true. Everybody thought it would be a super close race that Gillespie would squeeze out because he had the big mo. Mm. What did Northern win by nine or something like that? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. So actually, I'm just saying I'm we don't saying know which yes direction the polls are going to be wrong, but they could be wrong in either direction. That's always true. Uh, yeah. So only one side gets covered. Right. Well, uh, interesting. I mean, I wonder. I guess they fall back now on. Uh, I guess the gas price thing isn't working. Inflation isn't working. The gas prices uh, are too thing low. You know what that would do to us? <laughs> right. All the gas station owners are going to go out of business. Why do you hate small business owners? I imagine they now all will, ju I guess, put on fleece vests and talk about schools. Yeah. Well, you That's know, the other side of the coin is them. who, you know, they're very upset at Rick Scott. The National Rick Scott Committee has spent mm -hmm. all its money and it doesn't really have enough for get out the vote. But even more importantly, because Rick Scott uh, has mismanaged the funds, this means they can't afford to have yeah, I guess. an army of people go out to the gas stations and scrape off all the thank you Brandon <laughs> stickers. You did it, or I did that. Yeah, right. I guess it, it backfires now. And even if they f stumble on a message that works, will they be able to advertise it? Uh, no, I guess not if they've had all their money stolen. Thank you, Rick Scott, greatest Democratic operative in a decade. Hmm. Anyway, that's it for me. All right. End of the hour anyway. But, sure. uh, you know, Mondays are always tough because there's just so much to summarize. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will leave the uh, royal watching to somebody else. 
All right, I'll. Uh, Nine Eleven is already in the rearview mirror, so we can move on to do something else. Yeah, and uh, you know it's always politics. Okay, right. To, well, but to, today, it look, continues. it's almost ten o'clock. Uh, they better be in court, and they better yeah. get ready to uh, present to Judge Cannon. And I have to say, what it's the time. DOJ is doing makes perfect total sense, which is, of course, why people are worried about Cannon not accepting it. Yeah. Well, you know, she. I, I'm not a lawyer, but it makes total sense. Yes. We have to see just how... You, you can't have privilege on documents you don't own. Yeah. If you think that they're so important, give them back to the natural rightful owner, that would be the archives. Yes. None of it. None of the pleadings makes any sense. Uh, and the, uh, I think you mentioned there was a good compromise in there on the special master. You know, you deal a... A blow to Trump by eliminating one of his nominees as a total hack, but a win to him by choosing the other one that he had nominated. So you got to nominate the guy who actually got the job, but first you had to hear about one. Well, I, and the judge doesn't have to say, by the way, your second nominee is crazy. She can just go straight to, everybody seems to think this person is okay. Yeah. Why don't we yeah. just use no, that? She could say, look, I love your second nominee. I'd really yeah. rather have that. But everybody else seems to think that this person is okay. So you right. get that one. You could do that. Or that person is busy that day. They're entertaining at my birthday party as uh, making balloon animals. So <laughs> they're busy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're going to have to go with somebody else. Yeah. All right. Well, she's got the path open to her. Everybody, lots of praise at the end of last week for how well crafted the government's answer briefs have been and uh, they think that they foreclose a lot of weird actions by the judge they don't they just make them look weirder but yeah. you that's know, again their as, job. as i said uh, at the end of last week the thing is the doj is doing everything right and bad yeah. stuff still happens anyway because you know crazy judges crazy judges yeah, yeah well so john roberts is but, worried about the legitimacy of oh, the right. court well yes. duh yes because all your your farm teams suck so on top of that, but in addition to which, uh, yeah, apparently uh, Al Franken making a big splash on Sunday TV discussing that too. So probably a lot of people saw that. I can recap it if necessary. Thanks, Greg. Uh, we'll catch up with you again on Wednesday after the news slows down. See you then, metaphorically. <laughs> All right, welcome back now to the King Go in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, where were we? I don't remember. <laughs> we had no plan, as far as I can recall. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, hmm. No, okay, just a weird picture of Donald Trump coming across the screen. I was just wondering if it was going to say where he is, and uh, I don't understand how they lost track of him. Like, how is it that we don't know where he went, given that, I mean, he? I, I don't know what kind of motor katie was traveling with on the the reason it made the news or or twitter was because there was dramatic video dramatic ish video uh, sirens and lights of his motorcade from his bedminster golf course to morristown airport the small like little private jet airport um you know, I don't know what is it, like 30 something miles outside of uh, New York City. It's not the big airport around there. That would be, I guess, the, well, the closer one would be Newark International Airport. But Morristown is uh, small and easily accessed, you know, if you have a motorcade anyway with sirens and lights and stuff. So it's a quick way for him to jet to DC. Why he flew to Dulles rather than Reagan, or as people who have been around here for 100 years call it just National Airport. Um, but uh, why, we don't know. Uh, that's where the speculation came from. He was wearing the golf shoes. Was he going to his golf course to play? But it was a crap day. There's no real reason to believe he was going here to play golf. But he, maybe he's staying here. Where does he stay in the Washington, D.C. area? He doesn't own that hotel anymore, right? They sold that to the Waldorf chain. Uh, so I don't know. And so he took this big motorcade, you know, in the armored SUV, uh, Secret Service, the whole thing, cop cars, yada, yada. People were remarking on how uh, apparently somebody was saying, oh, they were driving like wild and crazy, more so than usual in a motorcade, whatever. Uh, then there was video of him. So it was a video of him uh, departing, like driving to 
Morristown Airport. No video from Morristown Airport on the tarmac. Then the next video that shows up is of his deplaning in Dulles, which is still a you know it's still an airport that serves Washington D.C. So it's not nonsensical. But if you were headed downtown, you'd think you'd land in National Reagan National Airport, right up close against the actual district line. Uh, just to the south across the river in, in Virginia. It's a quicker uh, drive into D.C. Uh, I guess you could say, well, maybe a lower profile airport, you know, landing at Dulles, less likely to have the National Press Corps there videoing you when you land in Dulles than in Reagan. But yet there was somebody there videoing him when he landed. But then... You know, they had all the cop cars and limos and whatnot out on the tarmac, just the same. Uh, he, he, I'm sure Trump, as ex-president, demands as big and as flashy a motorcade as he had when he was president. And I don't think that's usually the case, but I'm sure he's demanding it. Um, Secret Service, for some reason, I guess, willing to comply. And then local police uh, agencies lending their cars to it, you know, just as a part of coordinating with... Secret Service. So the thing is, they, they met him on the tarmac. I see in the video that there are local sheriff's department cars out there, plus the armored vehicles. Where did they go? Like one of the big things about the motorcade when you're president is that it includes a press contingent that they're always watching and they videotape everything. But everybody knows where a president is going. They announce where he's going. And I guess you don't have to as an ex-president, even though he keeps saying he is president, which he's not. But, like, did he lose track of it? Did nobody follow? Where did he go? I mean, it's a big question. Where does he stay is, a, is now a question. If we don't know what he's doing here, maybe some of the answers would be in where he, you know, <laughs> after those cars go. And then you'll have an idea. Like, if they go to McDonald's, stick around, see where they go after that. Um, if they go to his golf club, you know, okay. I mean, he's, I guess then you stick around and see if he's playing golf or maybe they throw you out because it's a private club and he's a private person now, even though he's claiming to be president. I have no idea. But if he's moving with that much fanfare, you should be able to tell where he lands. And now I do have that open question. Usually he, you know, when he was president, he would not stay over anywhere for the most part, except his properties, unless it was absolutely impossible um, and he was overseas. So, you know, with access to a private jet, he could have gone home yesterday. Did he go home? Did he go back to Bedminster? Did he stay over? Where? I didn't see any reporting on that this morning. And you know why? I didn't look. So, you know, I mean, there could be more reporting, but I was looking last night and there wasn't much of anything. And uh, I don't know. Let's see. I mean, also, what do you search for in the news? I'm like, well, I can all I have to do is search for Trump and Dulles. And then it's all stories about he landed at Dulles and then no updates. Like where else did he go? So did anybody see anything? I haven't. Uh, and I am curious as to where would he stay overnight in the D.C. area now that he doesn't own the hotel anymore. Anyway, now it's not news. It's just me worrying about the news. That's the rest of the show. Uh, let's see. Other things that uh, you might be uh, somewhat interested in. I'll just sort of run through them as they landed in reverse chronological order uh, in pocket and then skip over the ones that aren't super exciting. But here I enjoyed this comment uh, from, let's see, who was tweeting this one? Ah, here we go. Along with this story, made a very interesting comment. Susan Demas, the editor-in-chief and a columnist at Mi the Michigan Advance, uh, who, in highlighting a Michigan Advance story on uh, what? Uh, well, let me, uh, I'll set it up with her comment, which is a good one. When Republicans threaten to pull funding from a major university, in this case, Michigan State, for condemning your voter suppression measure, that is, well, we'll see which voting suppression measure it was in uh, 
in in Michigan. But when Republicans threaten to pull now they're threatening to pull funding from Michigan State, which I understand is popular inside Michigan, for condemning your voter suppression measure, but also claim to the media that it's not voter suppression that they're doing. It seems like Republicans are really into suppressing both voting and dissent, which poses a particular problem if, for instance, you're being accused of uh, moving towards a fascist or semi-fascist government, or at least semi-fascist in your approach to governance, uh, but you deny it and you're angry and you don't want anyone to think that you're fascist, but you're doing these things, well, then you're in trouble. So here's the Michigan advance story. MSU board eventually gives in here, pulls the voter suppression resolution following GOP, you know, GOP, defunding threat by John King of the Michigan advance. The Michigan State University Board of Trustees postponed Friday, voting on a resolution seeking to restrain the activities of university vendors connected to, and they enclose them in quotes here, voter suppression efforts. So they're even backing away from calling it voter suppression now, I guess. But anyway, the resolution in question, sponsored by Democratic trustees Rima Vassar. I don't know if it's like Vassar, like the school, or whether she says Vassar for some reason. But anyway, and Kelly Tebe was in the was in response to the Secure Michigan Vote Initiative, which would require mandatory identification for both in-person and absentee voting. How? I'm not sure. Bar mass mailings of absentee ballot applications and prohibit election funding by private groups. Okay. While its supporters missed the deadline to get the initiative on the ballot in November. <laughs> Did you realize that? I don't think that even struck me. But uh, so th this is interesting, too. Like, remember that it's Michigan that we heard about, I think, right? Not that long ago where, um, for instance, the voters or the um, uh, organizers had succeeded in getting the sufficient number of signatures to get a measure on the ballot that would protect abortion rights in Michigan and the board of canvassers, which, you know, stupidly enough is split two to two so that it could be totally fair, right? Uh, two to two in terms of a democratic and Republican representatives on the board. And the Republican representative said, it doesn't matter that you followed all the rules to qualify for the ballot. Having this on the ballot is bad for Republicans. And so we therefore vote the two of us know on including this thing on the ballot. Why it's even up for vote, I don't know, but that's the way it goes. And uh, so, voila, all of a sudden, uh, you you know, just use your votes to say no for no particular reason. And so, therefore, it's a tie and we can't do anything. And it was appealed to the Michigan Supreme Court and the Michigan Supreme Court pretty rapidly uh, overruled them and, and did rule that it would have to be included on the ballot. But then again, keep in mind that uh, voters have a say in who comprises the Michigan Supreme Court as well. So, you know, we'll see whether Republicans uh, cheat in that election to change the composition of the Supreme Court that screwed them over in their efforts to cheat in the other election. Anyway, among the other things, I guess, that have been going on, uh, is a group, like we said, called Secure Michigan Vote Initiative, trying to do the same thing. Well, yeah, well, we're going to have a referendum on what? Something that would bar mass mailings of absentee ballot applications, prohibit election funding by private groups, uh, and require mandatory ID for both in-person and absentee voting. Okay, well, if you follow all the rules and get enough signatures to get on the ballot in enough time, then uh, we have to let you on unless, of course, we don't have to let you on, which is the new way to read the rule. But it didn't matter because they didn't collect enough signatures in enough time. Uh, so that means they're not on the ballot, right? Well, hold on a second. Remember, there are two Republicans on this board. While its supporters missed the deadline to get the initiative on the ballot in November, it could still be enacted, but by this time, not by the uh, two to two divided membership of the Board of Canvassers, but rather by state lawmakers, the gerrymandered Republican I guess legislature in Michigan could say, remember, we have all the power in the world when it comes to elections. 
we were just saying the other day that they have all the power, or Republicans were claiming, they have all the power with respect to federal elections, believe it or not. But what about state elections? Hmm, no one mentioned that. But how about yes to having all the power over that too? Yeah, sure, why not? The state legislature would have all the power over that election too. And guess what? Uh, that would not be subject to Governor Whitmer's veto. So if the Board of Canvassers can't be depended on because it's divided two to two to power through this thing and say, I don't really care that you didn't get enough signatures. We're going to put it on a ballot anyway. Maybe the state legislature will do it. And it looks like they want to. Isn't that a great idea? Titled as Accountability of University Vendors Funding Voter Suppression. Now we're talking about the resolution offered by the Board of Trustees at MSU, they said, hey, this whole thing about where if you don't get enough signatures, but uh, we're going to put you on a ballot anyway, is kind of BS. So we have a resolution saying, be it therefore, be it now therefore resolved that we don't like this thing very much. I mean, okay. But we're going to take some action. If you are supporting this thing, and getting it on the ballot, particularly one, because it's voter suppression, and two, because it didn't qualify and you're going to do an end run and you're going to put it on the ballot anyway, while you were at the same time saying that things that do qualify don't get to go on the ballot, gee whiz, then, and you're funding it because you're a, you, and you've got money to fund it because the university is paying you money to sell us something. You're a vendor to the university, then we're going to do uh, something. I don't know what. Something bad to you, and maybe you won't be a vendor anymore. So that's the resolution. Uh, but it doesn't matter what the resolution said because it was removed Thursday night from the board's agenda and thus did not get a vote during the board's meeting on Friday. The resolution asked all politically active vendors to take concrete steps to defeat efforts at undermining democracy. Sounds like a good thing if you like democracy. Including reaching out to lawmakers with which they have a relationship or which they have, have relationships. What? Oh, I see. Okay. I've just switched around the order of the words here. Uh, but what sort of efforts to undermine democracy are, are being targeted here? If you are a vendor, what do you have to look out for? Uh, that would include reaching out to lawmakers with which they have relationships with... <laughs> It's two widths. One more width than was actually necessary. Uh, why would you be reaching out to lawmakers to communicate the importance of opposing voter suppression legislation, which would be a good thing to do? This is just weird. All right. So what? Oh, it asks all politically active vendors to take concrete steps to defeat efforts at undermining democracy, including if you are on the side of defeating efforts at undermining democracy, then please do reach out to your lawmakers if you have a relationship with one in order to communicate the importance of opposing voter suppression legislation. Okay. And ultimately to align their political support, including financial contributions of candidates and office holders with their professed values, providing that those values support free and fair access to the democratic process, stated the resolution. Not a great resolution, if you ask me. I mean... I would be happier with a resolution that says uh, something along the lines of, well, we will sever our ties, perhaps, with people who are underwriting the effort to undermine democracy. And while we could and should encourage people to speak with their lawmakers about protecting democracy, um. Yeah, where it kind of goes off the rails, it seems like, is is saying we want you to affirmatively uh, advocate for the other side. And it seems kind of weird. We, I, I think I would have kept it in the negative and say we're going to cut off our relationship with vendors who are spending the money we're paying them on efforts to undermine democracy. You know, and if you don't, you know work hard to be pro-democracy, well, you know, uh, I'm too bad for you and all, but I'm not going to, uh, like, disfavor you either. But if you're active in trying to undermine them, I don't know why they went, you know, I guess they thought they were being even more aggressive. 
let's see, maybe the background of the issue will help clear things up. The issue originally came up at a June meeting of the board, which has a 5-3 Democratic majority, after the Defend Black Voters Coalition, or DBV, called out university vendors, including Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and Delta Dental of Michigan for their political contributions. Okay, interesting. Uh, And they are, in fact, I guess, MSU vendors, I'm sure. I guess uh, employees of the university are covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield and Delta Dental of Michigan. And why pay them to be the health care coverage providers for employees of the university if they are going to then turn around and use that money to uh, undermine democracy by donating to Republican lawmakers who support these voter suppression efforts. Fair enough, right? Okay, so according to the DBV press release, since 2021, Blue Cross and Delta Dental have given $10,000 and $4,000 respectively to leadership PACs controlled by Michigan Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky. That's not a great deal of money, but it, I mean, it, it, in political terms, I guess, I mean, like I'd love to have it, but you see what I'm talking about. The, the two companies, including affiliated entities, have given $313,250 to the Michigan Senate Republican Campaign Committee, that's much more, that Shirky now oversees since the 2016 cycle, including $38,750 in the first half of 2022. So it continues, certainly. Shirky, who has been an outspoken supporter of the Secure Michigan Vote Initiative, the bad guys, right, was quoted by the Detroit News as threatening MSU's funding if the resolution passed. Mm -hmm. I will not let this stand, said Shirky. This will cause us to immediately reevaluate the legitimacy of this university and its board of trustees. We are not going to take this lying down. The budget is an impactful process. This is why public universities should be defunded. How do you like that? So now they're into the defunding thing after all. And uh, back where they started, you know, essentially undermining everything and, and using the public purse strings to punish everybody who might have something to say about the democratic process. In response, Democratic trustee Brianna Scott registered strong dissatisfaction with the decision to pull the resolution from the agenda This is strong dissatisfaction. It is just disgusting to me, she said, that the agenda item was removed today. It is distressing to me that we weren't able to move forward. I think that it is right for us to discourage people from purposely doing anything to impede the ability of black and brown voters to vote, which is their constitutional right. Vassar, or Vassar, or however she pronounces her name, a strong supporter of the resolution, responded directly to the defunding threat made by Shirky. Throughout the history of black voter suppression, there's also a constant threat of harm to those who have fought for freedom and fair access to the ballot, she said. There have been beatings, lynchings, massacres, and now threats to eliminate funding to MSU. It's abhorrent. I don't know if they're exactly in the same class altogether, but still, uh, defunding MSU, of course, would be uh, detrimental to many. But it's, you know, not the same class of offense, but this is this is modern political warfare. Board Chair Diane Byram, a Democrat, said the decision to pull the resolution was made in order to avoid the issue becoming overly partisan. Oh, dear. However, that shouldn't be interpreted as a lack of support for all citizens enjoying full voting rights, she said. Well, I should hope they support that. Removing the resolution today does not take away, even for a second, our passion and support for equal access to the ballot by all citizens, particularly our students, and black, brown, and working class individuals and families, said Bynum, a former legislative leader. In other news, the Detroit Free Press reported Sunday that the board has given MSU President Samuel Stanley until Tuesday to resign, reportedly regarding his handling of, well, I assume this is a typo, but reportedly regarding his handling of handling of the investigation of business school Dean Sanjay Gupta, who resigned in August. Okay. 
who I assume is a different Sanjay Gupta from CNN's health reporter or lead health guy. I don't remember what exactly they used to call him. Uh, but I am, I'm assuming there's plenty of Sanjay Guptas to go around. But okay. Well, anyway, and I, I imagine it was because of his handling of the investigation rather than the handling of the handling of the investigation. But sometimes these issues get complex. So it's either complex editing or a very complex issue. And uh, perhaps uh, some Michigander can tell us what the Michigas was about all of this and uh, straighten that one out. Okay, well, at any rate, um, that's news. And I liked, uh, I thought that was a good comment from Susan Gemmas. Yeah, that uh, when Republicans, Susan Demas, not Gemmas, Susan J. Demas, so I just threw it all together. When Republicans threaten to pull funding from a major university for condemning your voter suppression measure. Not great. Okay, good point about uh, the direction of Republican totalitarianism. All right, let's see other things that uh, deserve some mention today. Oh, that's an interesting and esoteric topic. We'll set that one aside for now. Uh, I did mention that the weekend was full of reading for me for, uh, let's see, on the subject of more uh, understanding generally the global non-British reaction to the passing of uh, Queen Elizabeth. And uh, let me add this to the to the pile here. There was some great uh, recounting of the anti-colonial struggles all over the world, but in particular in Africa, Kenya in particular, uh, and how poorly treated, to say the very least, the local population was. The Mau Mau uprising, right? Isn't that uh, what they were talking about? And just brutal repression as Britain fought a rearguard action to uh, in, in, in what eventually became the decolonization process. There's a lot of praise for the way uh, Queen Elizabeth handled decolonization as though it was done quietly, peacefully, an orderly transition. And I mean, it was more orderly than it could have been. And I guess by comparison to, say, the French decolonization process, which was more overtly violent, people maybe thought that that was the case, or at least that's the way it's taught. But uh, that wasn't the ground truth in Kenya, apparently. And so a lot of that information either... We're being reminded of it or reminded that, okay, only by comparison to the French was it any better. It really wasn't very good to begin with. And don't forget that, uh, you know, prior to that, the British weren't particularly uh, peaceful in their transition. Certainly they weren't particularly peaceful about it in India and elsewhere. Uh, and so maybe the record, you know, needs to be set straight. Uh, and it might have been perhaps somewhat less overtly violent in some places, but it was violent nonetheless. And it was only by necessity, as they realized we don't have the troops to simply massacre colonial uh, uprisings everywhere. So we're just going to have to do managed violence and only have it in some places. Uh, you know, they didn't give up the empire willingly from the beginning. It was a series of of uh, defeats for them or being overwhelmed by the numbers of people rising up in a number of places that they face the eventual understanding after killing lots of people or uprooting lots of people and destroying their lives that they couldn't handle it all. Um, but uh, I guess more to the point of this stuff coming to light, this Guardian article I found uh, very interesting. Though the article is quite old, it was being recirculated. Why is it that we think that this was the case, say, the British uh, withdrawal from the colonies versus the French? And maybe this has something to do with it. Like I said, this is a, an old article. It's more than 10 years old. This is an article from April of 2012. But again, The Guardian at that time reporting Britain destroyed records of its colonial crimes. A review from way back when, in 2012, I guess, found that thousands of papers detailing shameful acts were culled while others were kept secret illegally. And there's a very involved and complex legal web 
that uh, falls around this, uh, I guess, the, the British version of Freedom of Information Act, things coming into the public sphere after a certain number of years. So there's a scheduled release of some of these colonial papers from the colonial governments, keeping records of how Britain resisted decolonization, at least at the outset, that were supposed to become public, but simply did not. They just, you know, basically asked the Donald Trump question, well, what happens if we don't follow the law? and let these documents become public. And I don't know what the answer is, because it happened 10 years ago, but they were clearly very upset about it. But even worse, very often the directive was, well, as we're withdrawing from the colonies, we don't want these secret papers that reveal what we really did to the local population to fall into the hands of the new government. So remove them from these places, fly them back to Britain, or burn them, destroy them. Just don't let the the, the post-colonial governments know. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the Cake in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see. A uh, hmm, couple other things. Uh, I was looking for more direction that we might head in here, but uh, uh, Twitter is always a bad source for that because then I get something and say, oh, what is that? I have to go figure out exactly what they're talking about here because everything needs to be short because it's on Twitter and you don't get to the real story. Anyway, uh, yeah, anyway, I, I thought that was really pretty amazing, <clears throat> though uh, an old story, this Guardian thing, but it was new to me. And uh, as you could probably imagine, um, yeah, I mean, I think it goes a long way toward explaining how it is that we have gotten this incorrect, in all likelihood, incorrect view of how British decolonization really went. And part of the reason for that might very well be that the actual records of how decolonization actually went, or at least at the outset, were purposefully destroyed and or withheld from public view. And so, uh, you know, that'll play into things too, right? So, you know, the, the, the already uh, difficult transition, I guess, for British uh, believers in the monarchy, anyway, uh, given that one, she's, the, the, the queen has died, and so then there's the, oh, well, don't speak ill of the dead, or it's too soon kind of sentiment that we experience all the time here with gun tragedy um, they're now dealing with. But, uh, yeah, this uh, sort of uh, vague sense that uh, she's particularly deserving of honors from among Commonwealth nations in particular, or former colonies that, well, but don't you recognize that uh, decolonization was conducted so peacefully and in such orderly fashion. And those who are speaking out and saying, no, not my recollection at all, are uh, faced with, well, one, you know, emotional opposition because of the, you know, I guess if you're into the idea that there should be trauma and mourning over the death, all right, so you're already there and uh, you're not going to react uh positively to uh, people making, you know, even even uh, valid negative statements about uh, 
the passing of the queen. But at any rate, uh, they have, you know, well, if you think you're so right about how colonization was, how come there's no proof of the fact, you know, of these, these allegations that you make? And if you find out later that the answer is, well, you destroyed them all. That's the reason. That's kind of upsetting. So I'll give you a flavor of what's going on here. Uh, even though the article is 10 years old, as the Guardian is so helpfully pointing out, they're, they're, it's fantastic that they put the little warning right up at the top. This article is more than 10 years old. And I mean, I didn't notice that yesterday because, well, you know, 10 years ago, I probably wasn't paying close attention to what the British were doing with their colonial documents. I probably missed that. But 10 years ago, Ian Cobain, Owen Bocut, and Richard Norton Taylor reported this for The Guardian. Thousands of documents detailing some of the most shameful acts and crimes, crimes, yes, crimes, committed during the final years of the British Empire were systematically destroyed to prevent them falling into the hands of post-independence governments. An official review has concluded. And by the way, before we get to it, um, yeah, of course, a lot of the pushback is, well, you know, she's not actually involved in government, and so she may have had no idea that these things were happening, and it's difficult to unravel whether or not she did or didn't from my perspective, because I just don't know how much about that much about what they tell the the sovereign and what they don't. And I understand that there's this sort of distance and everything, but but the British make it really difficult to completely do away with that idea because, of course, of their peculiar way of expressing things uh, and constantly referring to it being Her Majesty's government. And we don't want anything that would embarrass Her Majesty's government. And, uh, well, you know, it's pretty hard to write Her Majesty out of this whole loop if it's constantly being referred to that way, even though I know it's just kind of a figure of speech. But still, you wonder. So we go on. Those papers that survived the purge were flown discreetly to Britain, like uh, the way Donald Trump did it. They were just absconded with and hidden away somewhere. Uh, Discreetly flown to Britain where they were hidden for 50 years in a secret foreign office archive beyond the reach of historians and members of the public and in breach of legal obligations for them to be transferred into the public domain. But what are you going to do, you know? The archive came to light last year, mind you, that would have been 2011, when a group of Kenyans, ta-da, detained and allegedly tortured during the Mau Mau Rebellion, won the right to sue the British government. At least they gave them that right. Granted that, recognized that right. The Foreign Office promised to release the 8,800 files from 37 former colonies held at the highly secure Government Communications Center at Hanslope Park in Buckinghamshire. Did they say Buckinghamshire? Buckinghamshire or something like that. I don't know. I, usually the sure thing, I've gotten used to that, but that's a weird one at the end of Buckinghamshire. How do you... Well, okay. British people are probably quite adept at it. The historian appointed to oversee the review and transfer, Tony Badger, master of Clare College, Cambridge, said the discovery of the archive put the Foreign Office in an embarrassing, scandalous position. These documents should have been in the public archives in the 1980s, he said. It's long overdue. The first of them are made available to the public on Wednesday, this is Wednesday, way back in 2012, at the National Archives at Q, is it K-E-W? Q, Q, I don't know, in Surrey. Who? I don't know. Who cares? It's in England. Uh, that's the important part. They're actually uh, releasing these things, and that's great and all, but again, this l- delayed release the fact that these things were hidden for 50 years that they were supposed to have been released in the 1980s is very relevant here right in addition to one the rest of us not knowing very much about what happened in decolonialization from the british empire um one the information wasn't available. And two, now, of course, they say, okay, so fine, the information is coming to light. Yes. And yes, it's true. But it was so long ago. So many years have passed. Can't we just get past the hard feelings? Well, 
in the 1980s, not that many years had passed. I mean, you're talking about decolonialization from the 1940s and 50s into the 60s. And then in the 80s, this should have come to light, but it didn't. And we had to wait another now 30, 40 years. And uh, now, gosh, it's so long ago, but that's part of the crime was that you made us wait this long to have the information. That's pretty interesting. The papers at Hanslope Park include monthly intelligence reports on the, quote, elimination of the colonial authorities' enemies in 1950s Malaya. I don't know how my pronunciation is going in British uh, world, but okay. Anyway, records showing ministers in London were aware of the torture and murder of Mau Mau insurgents in Kenya, including a case of a man said to have been roasted alive. That's in quotes. And papers detailing the lengths to which the UK went to forcibly remove islanders from Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, which, by the way, if you're thinking you'll skip out on any uh, implications of guilt, I guess, for Americans, that's now the big American Air Force base in the Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia, from which we apparently, I think, flew a lot of the B-52 missions in all the Middle East deployments and uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere for years. And I don't know what the ownership of the island actually is now, but I guess the fact that the you can have a gigantic air base there now probably owes to the fact that all the islanders were forcibly removed and they were forcibly removed by the British uh, for their own purposes, at our behest, I don't know. You're going to have to look into that, or maybe you know off the top of your head. However, we continue. Among the documents are a handful which show that many of the most sensitive papers from Britain's late colonial era were not hidden away. Shoo, right? They were simply destroyed. Oh, that's worse. These papers give the instructions for systematic destruction issued in 1961 after Ian McLeod, I hope I've got that pronunciation right, Secretary of State for the Colonies, I'm a famous guy, all British people all know him, not me, Secretary of State for the Colonies, directed that post-independence governments should not get any material that, quote, might embarrass Her Majesty's government. Whose government? Her Majesty's. The same Her Majesty? Yes, the same, of course. Nothing that could embarrass members of the police, military forces, public servants, or others, e.g. police informers, that might compromise intelligence sources or that might be used unethically by ministers in the successor government, like by saying, oh, well, this was true and it happened. Well, that would be unethical. Can't do that. That seems pretty remarkable. But, you know, totally in keeping with what, if we really think about it, we knew to be, you know, the British approach. I mean, they maintained an empire not because they were so super friendly and everyone loved tea, right? There was some brutal repression involved. Anyway, among the documents that appear to have been destroyed were records of the abuse of Mau Mau insurgents detained by British colonial authorities who were tortured and sometimes murdered. Reports that may have detailed the alleged massacre of 24 unarmed villagers in Malaya by soldiers of the Scots Guards in 1948. Most of the sensitive documents kept by colonial authorities in Aden, A-D-E-N, oh boy, um, who knows where we're getting to here, where the Army's Intelligence Corps operated a secret torture center for several years in the 1960s. Now, uh, I don't know exactly where we're talking about, but as I recall, isn't Aden, Aden, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, is a uh, a major city in, in Yemen. Are we talking about that one? Are they, is that where they kept a secret torture facility? Or they, they go on in this article to uh, uh, mention that the next... Uh, subject about which papers were destroyed was about British Guiana. Is is that is there another Aden Aden there? I don't know. 
Well, anyway, bad enough, wherever it is, that there was a secret torture center. Don't want to have secret torture centers, or any torture centers, really. But then again, we've had our share, apparently, too. <clears throat> uh, plus, also included in these uh, documents destroyed, every sensitive document kept by British authorities in British Guyana, a colony whose policies were heavily influenced by successive U.S. governments, whoops, and whose post-independence leader was toppled in a coup orchestrated by the CIA. And we did a few of those. The documents that were not destroyed appear to have been kept secret, not only to protect UK's, the UK's reputation, but to shield the government from litigation. Can't even address it in court and forget, you know, well, we're going to respond to your brutal repression and murder with a lawsuit. Well, that even that is too embarrassing for us. We can't have that. You know, certainly, well, you can't be violent. That's why we crack down because we can't just turn the world over to local uh, governments because there'll be violence and chaos that ensues. Uh, you, you, you can't just resort to violence. It has to be a uh, orderly transition. OK, well, how about suing you in your courts for the murders that you did in order to keep things orderly? Well, no, that would be too disorderly. You know, there's, it reminds uh, me a little bit of the, you know, well, you can't, uh, we can't have violent protests about uh, Black Lives Matter. Well, how about orderly ones where we just quietly take a knee? Well, we can't have that either. There's really just no way for you to do this. And similarly, not surprisingly, uh, same issues here with the people from whom most white European Americans claim descent, at least in the early days. That we did the same thing. Wow, what a surprise. Anyway, yeah, tragic uh, that uh, n nobody appears to have come out of this with clean hands from the European side of the thing, uh, of the uh, scale. The documents that were not destroyed, as we said, appeared to have been kept secret not only to protect the reputation, but uh, to shield the government from litigation. If the small group of Mau Mau detainees are, and this was 10 years ago, successful in their legal action... Were they? Anybody? I don't. You probably know in the UK. I don't. Thousands more veterans are expected to follow. And I hope that they did. It is a case that is being closely watched by former Eoka guerrillas. E-O-K-A. Guerrillas, like the, not the animal guerrillas, but the fighting guerrillas who were detained by the British in 1950s Cyprus and possibly by many others who were imprisoned and interrogated between 1946 and 1967 as Britain fought a series of rearguard actions, they fought those rearguard actions, across its rapidly diminishing empire. The documents show that colonial officials were instructed to separate those papers to be left in place after independence, usually known as legacy files, from those that were to be selected for destruction or removal to the UK. In many colonies, these were described as watch files and stamped with a red letter W, like uh, the Trump files that used to use C on people's applications for housing way back when, right? The papers at Q, I'm... Again, not sure how I'm pronouncing K-E-W, depict a period of mounting anxiety amid fears that some of the incriminating watch files might have been leaked. Officials were warned that they would be prosecuted if they took any paperwork home. Hint, hint. This is 10 years ago. And some were. As independence grew closer, large caches of files were removed from colonial ministries to governor's offices where new safes were installed. In Uganda, the process was codenamed Operation Legacy. In Kenya, a vetting process described as a thorough purge was overseen by colonial special branch officers. Clear instructions were issued that no, this is really something, no Africans were to be involved. Only an individual who was, quote, a servant of the Kenya government who is a British subject of European descent, could participate in the purge. Because otherwise, I assume they figured, well, you know, their loyalties may change once they see how many people we murdered. And maybe they would have. Uh, but okay. Painstaking measures were taken to prevent post-independence governments from learning that the watch files had ever existed. 
One instruction states the legacy files must leave no reference to watch material. Indeed, the very existence of the watch series, though it may be guessed at, should never be revealed. When a single watch file was to be removed from a group of legacy files, a twin file or a dummy was to be created to insert in its place. If this was not practicable, the documents were to be removed en masse. There was concern that McLeod's directions should not be divulged. There is, of course, the risk of embarrassment should the circular be compromised, and officials taking part in the purge were even warned to keep their W stamps in a safe place. Many of the watch files ended up at Hanslow Park. They came from 37 former, different former colonies and filled 200 meters of shelving but it is becoming clear that much of the most damning material was probably destroyed. Officials in some colonies, such as Kenya, were told that there should be a presumption in favor of disposal of documents rather than removal to the UK. Emphasis, it says in quotes, is placed upon destruction, and that no trace of either the documents or their incineration should remain. When documents were burned, the waste should be reduced to ash and the ashes broken up. I mean, this is the way the Nazis had hoped to exit the concentration camps, including, of course, burning all the people who were there being held there. But when they couldn't get to that, then at least the records and photographs should be destroyed. Some idea of the scale of the operation and the amount of documents that were erased from history can be gleaned from a handful of instruction documents that survived the purge. In certain circumstances, colonial officials in Kenya were informed it is permissible as an alternative to destruction by fire for documents to be packed in a weighted crate and dumped in a very deep and current-free waterway. I guess I'm restructuring this because I left an article out here somewhere. It is permissible as an alternative to destruction by fire for documents to be packed in weighted crates and dumped in very deep and current-free water at Maximum practicable distance from the coast. That is a lot of wordage. Dump it in the ocean in a way that won't resurface. Documents that survive from Malaya suggest a far more haphazard destruction process with relatively junior officials being permitted to decide what should be burned and what should be sent to London. Dr. Ed Hampshire diplomatic and colonial records specialist at the National Archive, said the 1,200 files so far transferred from Hanslow Park represented gold dust for historians with the occasional nugget rather than a hall that calls for instant reinterpretation of history. However, only one-sixth of the secret archive so far has been transferred. The remainder are expected to be at Kew by the end of 2013. And uh, I have no access to a follow-up article on this, but I imagine plenty exists. Uh, maybe if any of you are familiar personally with what happened, uh, I'd be appreciative of finding out. And if you sent any articles on, uh, I don't know whether we'll return to revisit this on the air or not, but I'm just personally interested in what happened. Okay, let's see. Finally, uh, perhaps we will... Um, wind up with this. Maybe we'll read the Washington Post's review of uh, from Philip Pump, Bump of where things stood before this morning's proceedings began at 10 o'clock on the Mar-a-Lago Papers case. Uh, and, uh, oh, and as a matter of fact, maybe we'll switch over. I, yeah, this, I'd rather read this one actually about, uh, that's the Philip Bump one, but the, the subject is different. Um, but another court case, uh, that went very poorly for Trump. This was not about the papers case, but just an indicator of, uh, you know, the quality of his legal team and legal claims that I'm interested in. Trump presented his Russia hoax theory to a court it went poorly. That's the headline on this piece. What else did I have from this? Was there a comment about it in um, 
pocket that I had put away or not. All right. Well, I, I should just get to it because time is getting short here. Uh, but apparently I didn't even really track this one very closely, but it does ring a bell. Trump at some point decided to file suit as he always threatens to do. I'm going to sue everybody. I'm going to sue Hillary Clinton and, uh, you know, God knows who to, over the whole Russia hoax. I'll show you that it was a hoax. So apparently, you know, he voluntarily took this stupid story to a court where they actually pay attention to things like proof and evidence and you have to testify under oath, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the whole thing collapsed. Uh, one of the hallmarks of Donald Trump's tenure in American politics has been the extent to which he remained cocooned in his own world. As president, that was often literal. He moved from the White House to his properties, to tightly controlled events, and to boisterous political rallies, rarely coming across critics or skeptics. And when they do, they would bicycle by and give them the finger and become famous, right? Uh, it was also true of his presence in the public conversation. He had his Twitter universe and his Fox News conversations, and he was content. Outsiders would peek in and report on what he was doing and saying and how it was received, but with a Star Trek-like result. There was no observable impact on the universe being watched, I see. It was a rhetorical terrarium, self-contained and self-sufficient, an ecosystem where nonsense thrived and spread, where false accusations competed Darwinistically for dominance. So his vague dismissals of the Russia investigation as a hoax in early 2017, had, by 2021, become complicated organisms, vines stretching and intertwining throughout the pro-Trump media universe. And then, earlier this year, a change. Trump proudly removed his Russia theory from its home and presented it to the court, like a child digging up a dandelion he's been watching in his yard and offering it as a horticultural contender at the state fair. The verdict offered in a filing on Thursday, was probably not what Trump would have hoped. But a great metaphor there, right? Oh, I've dug up a dandelion. I've been watching it grow. Uh, but yeah, compared to like real entries, duh. Suffice to say, he did not earn a blue ribbon. The background here is interesting, by the way. Trump presented his grand Russia hoax theory in the form of a lawsuit, alleging that Hillary Clinton and others, FBI officials, attorneys, IT guys, had all conspired against him in violation of racketeering statutes. That is RICO. Yes, really, he filed a RICO suit. The suit was filed in a specific courthouse, in the Southern District of Florida, apparently with the hope that it would be heard by a particular judge that Trump himself had appointed. And guess who he was looking for? He was looking for Judge Cannon. But he didn't get her. Whoops, and that's what happened. That's what went wrong. It wasn't. Indeed, it landed with District Judge Donald M. Donald, that's funny. Middlebrooks. When Trump's legal team quickly moved to have Middlebrooks removed from the case, alleging bias. Middlebrooks responded by disparaging the transparency of Trump's effort. I note that the plaintiff filed this lawsuit in the Fort Pierce division of this district, where only one federal judge sits, Judge Eileen Cannon, whom plaintiff appointed in 2020. He wrote, in denying Trump's request, despite the odds, this case landed with me instead. And when plaintiff is a litigant before a judge that he himself appointed, he does not tend to advance these same sorts of bias concerns. Eileen Cannon, you may be aware, of course, is the jurist who recently issued a ruling of remarkable favorability on Trump's behalf in the matter of the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago. Middlebrooks's blunt tone in assessing Trump's intent carried through to his dismissal of the lawsuit this week. And you can read through the entirety of it, if you like, on your own. It is said to be spectacular. Plaintiff's theory of this case set forth over 527 paragraphs in the first 118 pages of the amended complaint is difficult to summarize in a concise and cohesive manner. Middlebrooks wrote as he began picking away Trump's at Trump's allegations. Uh, it was certainly not presented that way. In short, 
The theory that flourished in Trump's friendly ecosystem was that the Russia probe was a function of explicit dishonesty on the part of Clinton and that her allies sought to create a dossier of false reports about Trump and Russia uh, that they had used stolen data to suggest a link between Trump's business and a Russian bank. The suit was filed only after the latter allegation became a central part of the special counsel John Durham's investigation. Durham, you'll recall, was appointed by then Attorney General William Barr specifically to try to see whether a case could be made to cast the investigation into Russian interference as flawed or biased. Unfortunately for Trump, the case was also filed before Durham's case fell apart and before the lawyer targeted for prosecution, Michael Sussman, was found not guilty by a jury. The amended complaint cites copiously to the indictment of Michael Sussman and a substantial portion of the amended complaint contains its allegations, Middlebrooks writes at one point, but nowhere does the amended complaint mention Mr. Sussman's acquittal. Yeah, and that part is missing. Isn't that curious? As one would expect, the focus on the decision is focus of the decision is on the legal merits of the case, which Middlebrooks found entirely unconvincing. Plaintiff cannot state a RICO claim without two predicate acts. That's the requirement. And, for example, after two attempts, he has failed to plausibly allege even one. Middlebrooks derides the sloppiness of the Trump team's presentation, the obvious challenges with the statute of limitations for any such suit, and the quality of the evidence offered. At one point, he notes that Trump's lawyers misunderstood an allegation centered on computer hacking. What must be off limits, he explains, is the area of the computer from which the information was obtained, not the information itself. At another, he reflects on the circuitousness of Trump's assertions about the FBI probe into interference codenamed Crossfire Hurricane. Perplexingly, plaintiff appears to argue that the defendants obstructed investigation Crossfire Hurricane by contributing to the initiation of Crossfire Hurricane. He writes that defendants could have obstructed a proceeding by initiating it defies logic. Oh, there's more just like that. And of course, the entire decision, which you might find quite entertaining. But let's say that's not enough for you and you need more. Well, there's always Justice Putnam and the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, which comes up next. From NetworksRadio.com You have been listening to Kegro in the Morning with David Waldman. The teaser here, Bill Barr is a coward. Stay tuned to find out what that's all about, plus more, of course. For instance, the black pastor in Alabama who was arrested by white police officers while watering the flowers for an out-of-town neighbor has filed his federal lawsuit. So we'll look forward to more action on that front soon. Stay tuned.